Well, hi everyone. I'm Andrew Scott from Inside Asian Gaming and I'm here to talk to you about land based in Japan. So I'm based in Macau. I'm in Macau now. I've been here for 11 years and uh, before that Hong Kong for five years and I visit Japan very regularly about one week uh, a month. And uh, that's because IAG, Inside Asian Gaming, we launched uh, IAG Japan, a dedicated Japanese brand in uh, January last year, January 2019. And that involves a daily gaming industry e-newsletter and a monthly digital magazine. And uh, it's in English and in Japanese, every word. And uh, it's about 2000 stories per year. So we're publishing many, many stories every day. Um, We've only got a short session together today, so um, if you're looking for a deeper dive into Japan or, or other stuff that we do, please visit our website, asgam.com, that's A-S-G-A-M.com, or in Japanese language, asgam.jp, uh, and you'll find a real treasure trove of information there. So let's uh, start with some background on, uh, on Japan land-based gaming. Uh, there are five such legal forms of gaming right now already. Uh, there's the JRA, the J uh, Japan Racing Association, that conducts horse racing in Japan. That's about a $7 billion a year, US dollar a year um, industry. There's the JKA, which regulates parimutuel betting uh, on a motorcycle and uh, bike racing, Kieran racing. Um, and also there's parimutuel betting on motorboat racing as well. Those three are worth about $6 billion a year. There are some lotteries in Japan as well, including some scratch cards that you'll find in the street. That's about $4 billion a year. So I think it's about a $16, $17 billion uh, a year uh, industry uh, for land-based legal gaming right now without casinos. You'll find poker rooms and mahjong parlors in uh, Japan. That's a bit of a gray area. Um, underground illegal casinos exist. They get raided and shut down from time to time. But the granddaddy of all uh, land-based gaming in uh, Japan is, of course, Pachinko. If you don't know what Pachinko is, Google it, P-A-C-H-I-N-K-O. It's officially not views, viewed legally as gaming, but as amusement. But nevertheless, there are 10,000 Pachinko parlors in Japan with about 4 million Pachinko and Pachi slot machines uh, across the country, taking in US 32 billion uh, in 2018. 2019 data's not out yet. So that's nearly as big as the entire Macau gaming industry. Now, despite these big numbers, Pachinko is actually in decline. It's actually declined about 50% over the last decade. So when uh, casino gaming does come to uh, Japan, and it will, it will be the second biggest market in the world after Macau, of course. Uh, estimates range of how big the GGR will be Estimates I've seen as low as 10 billion, as high as 25 billion, but whatever that number is, it's gonna be number two uh, in the world. Efforts to legalize casino gambling in Japan have been going on for over 20 years. Uh, in December 2016, the um, IR promotion law was first uh, passed. And at that time in 2015, the year before, there were 20 million inbound tourists to Japan. And the goal was to increase that to uh, 40 million by 2020 and to 60 million by 2030. That was followed by the IR implementation law in July 2018, which set out industry rules and regulations. Most importantly, that there would be three licenses and that after seven years after those issuing of those three licenses, then perhaps some more licenses would be, would be looked at. In September 2019, there was the release of the draft central government IR basic policy. And I have to explain the, the license process involves both local and central government in Japan. So what happens is candidate operators have to first get married, so to speak, to the local, uh, the locations who are also bidding for a license in their location and go hand in hand to the central government to apply for a license together. So between November last year and April this year, four local governments in Japan issued draft implementation policies. They were Osaka, Yokohama, Wakayama, and Nagasaki. So they're the four locations right now that we're looking at. And then on the 26th of July this year, the central government under that 2018 legislation I mentioned before, is required to issue their final IR basic policy. Once they've done that, that will then allow the local governments to issue their final policies 
partner up with the, their preferred operators, and then uh, move on to the next stage, which is the key period from the 4th of January to the 30th of July, 2021. That's when uh, the applications to the central government will be made by those local governments partnered up with their operators. So when will the doors open, I hear you ask? Well, by the time the federal licensing uh, process, or the central government, I should say, licensing process goes through and construction happens, which will be slow in Japan, uh, you are looking at 2026 as an earliest date uh, that's being touted right now. It could easily be 27, 28. If a few things go wrong, uh, it could even be 2030, which I know sounds like a long way away, doesn't it? So what are the known factors? What do we already know? Well, we know a few things. We know there are gonna be three licenses. We know that uh, they're gonna look at licenses again after seven years, a second round of licenses. We know that uh, those licenses are gonna last for 10 years. We know that after the 10 years, they'll be renewed every five years. We know there's gonna be a 30% gaming tax, so quite high. We know that the gaming area in an integrated resort is gonna be limited to 3% of the total floor area of the integrated resort although exactly what counts as that floor area is not been totally finalized. We know the entry will be free to international visitors, but will be 6,000 yen to uh, locals. So that's 54 US dollars. So quite a steep uh, entry fee. Uh, we know that public support is quite low in Japan. The understanding of IRs in Japan is quite low. Uh, we know construction will be slow and expensive. That's the nature of construction in Japan. And finally, we know that IRs do not enjoy bipartisan political support. So Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will likely continue to keep pushing it through and push ahead with the current timeline, because if there is a change of government, the whole thing could, uh, could, could even go south. Locations, let's talk about locations for the three IR sites. So currently, there is no distinction between a major metropolitan site and a regional site, which kind of doesn't make sense commercially, as I'm sure you'll all appreciate. So Osaka is probably the most advanced of the four. Um, it is a major metropolitan site. It is the second biggest city in Japan. There are 23 million people in the Kansai area that Osaka is in. Osaka is right in the middle of Japan. They've already completed their RFP process and there's only one operator left standing and that's MGN. So with their local partner, Oryx, O-R-I-X, local Japanese partner, they're the only ones left standing. And they're aiming for late 26. So are uh, MGM de definitely, definitely going to be the license holders in Osaka? We don't actually know. Don't be surprised if that race kind of opens up again for a variety of reasons to do with both Japan, uh, Osaka, and even MGM itself. It's gone through a lot of changes. Yokohama. Um, it is part of the greater Tokyo area, which is the largest metro, uh, metropolitan area in the world, 38 million people. If you've ever been in central Tokyo and uh, got the train down to Haneda Airport, we'll just keep going for about another 25 minutes and you'll find yourself in uh, Yokohama. It's under an hour to central Tokyo, huge population base to draw from, and a supportive mayor who's now come out and said she supports the process. So that's probably the most sought after right now. Wakayama, it's 75 minutes south of um, Osaka. It's a regional location, smaller. The location has already been picked. It's Wakayama Marine City. And the mayor, so the governor, sorry, has been pushing uh, for a long time on Wakayama. Nagasaki is at the extreme west of Japan or extreme south, if you prefer. Again, the location has been picked. It's at Sasebo uh, City, House Ten Bush, H-U-I-S-T-E-N, B-O-S-C-H, you can Google it. Um, sites that are talked about but are not officially in, haven't put their hands up. Well, Tokyo, obviously, much speculation around Tokyo, but they've been distracted by the 2020, now 2021 Olympics. Um, Nagoya, there's been talk. Hokkaido was sought after, Tomokamai City, but they've now withdrawn. The governor came out on the 29th of November last year and withdrew. Okay, operators. So there should be a slide come up on your screen now of uh, a bigger list of all the operators. We don't have time for a close look at them all, but in the January, March and April issue um, uh, of IAG this year, I wrote a series of um, three articles totaling a little over 10,000 words doing a really deep dive on these operators. So if you wanna know more, uh, take a look at that. 
MGM with Oryx in uh, Osaka, Galaxy partnered up with SBM from Monaco, uh, Genting Singapore, uh, Las Vegas Sands are out, uh, Wynn, Melco, Sun City, these are the big names. Uh, latest developments, well, on the 13th of May, as I mentioned, Las Vegas uh, Sands pulled out. Why? Well, the Yokohama mayor blamed COVID. Well, I think that's a convenient excuse. Uh, Sands told us themselves in their press release, they pointed to the framework around, around the process and other opportunities, indicating that perhaps other opportunities would be more attractive. Well, this has been a common theme recently. Others are talking about difficulties around the process and a low ROI. The general consensus is that Japan has been quite demanding in the process, that returns are clouded by uncertainty in quite a few areas. Uh, companies are being asked to make proposals and make commitments without knowing the full rules of the game. They don't even know where the locations are definitely going to be. 3% of floor area will 3% of what? Japan has come out and said repeatedly that they will be the strictest regulatory regime in the world. Well, that's hardly music to the ears of an operator. Uh, this is all being done against the background of COVID-19 that we're all suffering right now. So that doesn't help. Some of these operators are burning through two, three, four, five, even more million US dollars a day because of their operations in Las Vegas or Macau or, or even Singapore. So when you combine a 10 year license, which is not that long, uh, financing difficulties because of the short license, five year renewals after the 10 years, 3% only of floor area, a 30% tax rate, a 6,000 yen entry fee, a potentially 10 billion uh, US dollar investment, which is what's being talked about, the, and the uncertainties mentioned already, it's not that attractive to some people. A lot of people are saying, Have, has Japan government messed up? Do they need to go back to the drawing board? Is Las Vegas Sands withdrawal a tactic to try and get them to go back to the drawing board? Some people say it is. Some people even say that it's giving Shinzo Abe ammunition to go back and say, look, we need to rethink that. Other analysts disagree and say Sands are completely out. Impact on other markets, I've been asked to comment on that. Very quickly, Macau and Singapore, no effect. Macau is fed by China, Singapore is fed by Southeast Asia. Philippines, a little bit, mainly a locals market, plus Korea, a little bit of Japan, but not much. Korea, Korea will be the one that is really hurt when Japan opens. They don't have locals gaming bar one property, and the main feeder market to Korea is Japan. So obviously it will be hurt quite badly. Um, thanks for your time. My time is up. Thanks for listening. If you want to get know more about uh, gaming in Asia, iGaming or bricks and mortar gaming, be it in Japan or elsewhere, please get in touch. Thank you very much. Bye.